Praise the Lord and welcome to Friday Night Alive. I'm Bob Fowler and what an honor, privilege, and joy it is for me to be with you. Whether you're joining me on the live stream or whether you're watching on the rebroadcast, welcome to the program. Hey, let's celebrate together. You made it through another week. You've experienced God's faithfulness in another week. Come on, every, if you're a believer, God has shown up in the last week. Now, maybe you've been so busy. And I got to tell you, busyness is the enemy of intimacy. If you don't hear anything else tonight, you need to hear what I just said. Busyness is the enemy of intimacy intimacy. Now, I didn't have that written down, but the Holy Ghost just flowed right through me and said that tonight. Busyness is the enemy of intimacy. You remember Mary and Martha and Jesus? One was busy in the kitchen getting things to get. The other was sitting at the feet of Jesus desiring intimacy. Ah, my friend, sometimes we can mistake being busy for being spiritual, but we've got to be cautious and careful that busyness does not try to take the place of intimacy. And yes, we come right back to my favorite word that I believe is the most beneficial thing that any of us have ever received as the result of salvation, and that is a relationship with God. God. Ah, my friend, he desires to be close to you and you close to him. Intimacy. He desires us to lean not on our own, on our own understanding, but in all of our ways, acknowledge him. Now, I want to tell you something that intimacy does not happen by accident. It is by intentional action on our part. Let me say that again. Intimacy does not take place by accident. It takes place by intentional action on our part. When we make the decision, the choice. Somebody said one time, there's nothing more powerful than a choice. The question is, and the problem is not us making choices, but it's what we are making our choices toward. And that leads me into what we're going to talk about tonight. And I pray some of you, as you join the program tonight live, that you'll send in your comments, your prayer requests, your praise reports. Tell me what God has been doing in your life so we can celebrate together. But tonight, I want to talk about something that the Holy Spirit has laid upon my heart that is extremely important. It is something that you and I have to be very aware of, as well as, again, intentional to do. You know, sometimes we say we're waiting on God, but if the truth be told, we could hear God saying, I'm waiting on you. Draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. That drawing, that desire, that action that is put with the desire is something that is for us to do. Come on. I I, I know you didn't tune in tonight to be told what to do, but you shall know the truth, and it's the truth that you know that will set you free. Truth in and of itself has never, ever set anybody free. But it is the intentional receiving and the application of truth in our lives that will set us free. Romans 8, 1 says there's now. Now what? Now in Christ. There is now no more condemnation to those who are in Christ. Now that is a truth. That is an absolute spiritual law. But if we do not enter in and engage, come on, just because two people are married and they're laying in the bed doesn't mean that they're going to have a child. And I wonder how many people are fitting that description. 
like a husband and wife laying in a bed, sitting there waiting and wondering why they're not having a baby. Well, it requires action. <laughs> and if you're going to have an intimate relationship with God, it's going to require action. And that leads into what we're going to talk about tonight, obedience and servanthood. And more than likely, I'm going to do my best to get through the first part, obedience. Now listen, I, and I've said this for years and years and years, obedience is a beautiful word when you understand it through the scriptural point of view. And that's what we want to do tonight. We want to look at obedience and servanthood and how it glorifies God, but how it benefits you in your walk and in your relationship with God. So let's get into that tonight. And who we're going to use as a springboard is, is Elijah and Elisha. And we're just going to take a snippet of their relationship and their life. Let's get into this tonight. I hope you're as excited as I am. And I pray you open up your heart. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you that you would open the ears of understanding in the lives of your people. Despite what they've heard before, despite what they've been taught, despite how they've been raised, I ask you tonight that you would give them the courage to dare to open their heart with expectation to receive this word from you tonight. And I promise I'll give you all the glory and all the honor in the matchless, wonderful, almighty name of Jesus, I pray. Obedience and servanthood. I want to look at the call of Elisha. Most of you probably know the story, but I want to read the scripture and then go back and just highlight a few points. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 through 21, we read, So he departed, talking about Elisha. God had given Elisha specific commands in what to do. And one of them was to anoint Elisha to replace him. Now, how would you like it if God showed up in your life and here you are, you're doing whatever you're doing, you're successful, you may be the president of a company, you may be the CEO of a company, and God speaks to your heart and identifies a person and says, I want you to begin spending time with them, teaching them, training them, mentoring them, because they are going to replace you. Now, that's what God told Elijah. He said, you go and you find Elisha and you anoint him because he is the one that will eventually replace you. So we jump into the story. So he, Elijah, departed from there and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphath, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the twelfth. Then Elijah passed by him, and he threw his mantle on him. That mantle represented his anointing, his calling, the authority that God had given him. It wasn't something to be taken lightly. And so Elijah comes and he throws his mantle on Elisha. And verse 20 says, and he, he, and he left, talking about Elisha, and he left the oxen and he ran after Elijah. So what happened is Elijah just walks up to him, takes his mantle, throws it on Elisha, and then he starts walking away. Now, if you read the scripture and study Elijah, Elijah could be a little edgy. 
<laughs> some would say, would would say he was a little harsh. He was a little coarse. Uh, he was a little uh, uh, difficult sometimes to uh, maybe function with and and uh, work with. But this is what the story tells us, that Elijah walks up to Elisha while Elisha is plowing the field with his 12 yoke of oxen, and he throws his mantle on this young man, and then he walks away. Verse 20 says, And Elisha left the oxen, and he ran after Elijah, and he said, Now this is what I want us to pay attention to because it's extremely important when it comes to obedience. It says that Elisha left his oxen and he ran after Elijah. And this is what he said, because he understood what was taking place. But this is what he said to the man of God. Please let me kiss my father and my mother And then I will follow you. Can you imagine Jesus coming up to the disciples while they're mending their nets? And he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they said, Lord, that sounds great. But I've got a garden at my house that I'm just about ready to pull the ripe tomatoes off of the vine. After I harvest the tomatoes, then I will follow you. Do you see or sense something a little off with that? Here we're called by God to do something, and we put it off. We delay it. We put something in front of that, and whether we realize it or not, my friend, whatever we put in front of obeying God, we are elevating that thing above God, above God's will, and above what God is telling you to do. Now, I said earlier that busyness is the enemy of intimacy. Busyness is the enemy of intimacy. I want you tonight, you know, it's very easy for us as people to look out beyond ourselves and judge other people. Now, I know you don't do that, but maybe you know somebody who does. Judging, finding fault, criticizing other people for millions of different reasons. The clothes they wear, the hairstyle they have, their skin suit. Come on, somebody. I want to get into some areas tonight that need to be uprooted and thrown away in our lives. There are some of you that are walking through life carrying excess baggage. And I believe that if you'll stick with this program and this teaching, that the Holy Spirit of God will reveal to you not only the what, but the how to get rid of it. Please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Now listen to what the man of God, Elijah, says to this young man. And he, Elijah, said to him, go back again for what have I done to you. What have I done to you? You're so tied up with where you're at. You're so tied up 
with the way you've always done things. You're so tied up in your responsibility in this case to your mom and to your dad. Oh my Lord, what have I done to you? He might as well said, go back home and spend time with mommy and daddy. You're still green. You're not ready to follow with me, follow God with me. You're not ready to take upon yourself the mantle that I threw upon you, the mantle that represents God's calling, God's authority in your life and in this life. You see, Elijah realized because of the word of the Lord that this young man was to replace him. I would imagine he was thinking, God, you sure you got the right one? He wants to go home and kiss mommy and daddy goodbye before he follows and does the will of God in his life. Remember, busyness is the enemy of intimacy. There's a lot of Christians that are busy about the work of the Lord, but are they busy about the Lord of the work? Intimacy, time together with the Lord, conversations between you and Him, personal private worship, intimacy, time that you spend with God. He said, go back again for what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and he slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the ox, the oxen's equipment. And he gave it to the people and they ate Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Now, I'm sure if you've been in church any length of time, you've heard messages about sacrificing the oxen and burning the plow, burning the bridges. I'm not going back. I'm going forward. I'm not going to stick with the same old, same old and what I've become used to and accustomed to. No. Listen, my friend, you can't box God in. You can't corral God into a corral and close the gate and say, I'm just going to keep God right here. No, God is an adventurer. God is a God that wants you to experience what you do not understand or know in this present moment. He wants you to walk in revelation. Not that what's revealed is created, but it's there all the time and he reveals it to you so that you can have a clearer understanding of who he is, who you are, and what he has called you to do. You know, sadly, a lot of Christians are satisfied to just be saved. I'm saved. I don't want to do much for God. I don't want to pray for the sick. I don't want to cast the devils out. I don't want to, I, 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 I don't want to walk in the miraculous. I don't want to hear from God. I just want to be saved so that I'm going to heaven. That is not the complete picture. Yes, Jesus died so you could be forgiven and so you could receive him and go to heaven. But my friend, he also says, occupy until I come. Occupy. Take territory. Occupy. Now, in this story, it is so clear concerning Elisha's hesitancy. Hesitancy. Hesitancy, hear me now, 
And if you're taking notes, write this down. Hesitancy is the enemy of obedience. Busyness is the enemy of intimacy. But hesitancy is the enemy of obedience. Let me read to you what the word hesitancy means. It means slowness in acting or deciding due to doubt. Now, the last time I checked, doubt is not a healthy ingredient to be in the life of a Christian. Are you hearing me tonight? Doubt is not a healthy ingredient to be in the life of a Christian. A little bit of doubt cancels out a lot of faith. It means, hesitancy means doubt or uncertainty, indecision, lack of willingness. You know, I meant to look the scripture up, but the writer of old in the Old Covenant said, how long will you halt or hesitate or stay stuck between two opinions. Joshua stood and said in Joshua 24, choose you this day, make a decision. You see, that is opposite of this definition of hesitancy. Hesitancy means indecision, lack of willingness, or eagerness to do something. Now, as I was preparing this, one of the greatest examples of someone who hesitated to obey the will and the word of God was Pharaoh. It took 10 plagues in order for that man to humble himself to the point of saying, okay, I'll allow what God wants to take place. Now, before you jump on Pharaoh, this is not about Pharaoh tonight. This is not about Elijah tonight. This is not about Elisha tonight. It's about you. It's about where you are in your relationship with God and specifically obedience and servanthood and to inquire within whether you are operating in hesitancy. Now, I want you to understand something tonight. If God has put a word in your heart, a vision in your heart, a dream in your heart, somehow, some way, he expects that dream, that vision, and that word to be fulfilled. Now, with that said, because God's not going to give you a word, a dream, or a vision, a desire, just to frustrate you. So if you're frustrated, something more is going on. And quite possibly, if you're willing to, and daring enough to investigate inside your life, inside your mind, quite possibly you will discover that you are functioning and tolerating hesitancy. Now remember the definition. Hesitancy means doubt. It means indecision. It means halting between two opinions. The Apostle Paul, standing before King Agrippa, simply to give his testimony of the goodness of God and how he became a Christian, he stands before King Agrippa, Agrippa and all of the people that were there, and he begins to testify of how a bright light shone down from heaven and struck him down and gave him blindness. And he went through the whole story of how he 
became a Christian with the desire that hopefully his testimony would touch somebody's heart, touch somebody's life, and that they too would receive Christ. But in Acts chapter 26, verse 19, after Paul is giving his testimony, Paul's, uh, or in, in the midst of his testimony, Paul says to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, verse 19, therefore, the Apostle Paul speaking, King Agrippa, I listen to what his words are. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Now, Paul is testifying here that I have done everything that God has told me to do. I have obeyed in everything that he said to me. And I stand before you as a mere man, but a man that has been changed by the gospel and a man who has taken a journey with God and each time God told me to do or say something, I have not been disobedient in it. What a testimony. I I pray that each of us would be able to say that about our own lives. And that if that is not the case in this particular moment when you're watching this program, that you will make a decision, a choice to change. No matter what people have said to you, no matter what lies you've listened to and adapted into your life, I pray that you'll hear truth tonight and the truth that you're open and receptive to, that truth will set you free. Again, truth in and of itself will not set anybody free. But truth applied, truth appropriated to our lives, accepted into our lives, it is that truth that will set us free. After all of that, after all of Paul's testimony, Most is acceptable, but is it really? What if you were on an airplane and you were flying in and just before the plane touches down, there is a terrible problem that occurs and everybody dies. You know what that pilot would say? I almost landed that plane. Would you ever want to be on a plane that part of their branding is, we almost land every single time? I don't know about you, but I would never board one of those airplanes. I almost landed. I, I, I almost did it. You know, almost landing a plane is a plane crash. He said, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. I got close. 
I almost yielded. I almost said yes. I got excited to hear what you were talking about. I almost bought into what you're talking about. My friend, almost is a failure. And when it comes to obeying God and doing what God tells us to do, if you're a believer, your heart should not be resistant. Your heart should be supple, should be moldable, should be shapeable. Remember, delight yourself in the Lord. That word delight means to make your, yourself moldable, shapeable, pliable, and usable in the hand of God. You see, if you're a believer tonight, and your heart resists the Holy Ghost, resists Him drawing you, resists you obeying what He tells you to do, if that is your struggle, your issue, it is an extremely important one for you to take care of and to change. You know, if you're truly born again, born of the Spirit, you have a heart that desires to please God. And you have a heart, you have a spirit anyway, that desires to honor God. But the challenge is in our soul, man. We've said it before, we're a soul, we have a spirit, we live in a body. Your spirit is born again, it's washed, it's cleansed, it's sealed. But your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions... That's another issue. James declares that it's in the engrafting of the word that saves the soul. Well, God doesn't engraft the word in us. We engraft the word. We, David said, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you, that I might not miss the mark. You see, there are a lot of things that you and I have to do and the responsibility is on us to do them. And one of those things is to engraft the word, but also to obey. Do you know that every time that God tries to get a hold of your heart to speak a word into you for you to do something, do you know that you make a choice whether you're going to say yes or no? You make the choice. I almost obeyed God. I almost did what God told me to do. And I'll just get right down to the nitty gritty. And so it applies to every aspect of our lives, but it applies to your money. It applies to you tithing on every dollar you make. Because that tithe is not yours. That tithe belongs to God. Now, right now, I can just feel people cringing and holding back. Why is that? Because God is your money and you're a lover of money. And the bad news is the word declares it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Do you realize if you're a lover of money, all types of evil is going to take place and take hold of your life? <laughs> All I have is yours, God. My money, my life, my breath, my strength, my gifts. I give my whole life to you. And that includes everything. Your time, your talent, your tithe, your money. Every aspect of who you are belongs to you. You know, it is because of the lack of that perspective that a lot of people struggle in obeying God. I'll obey a God on Sunday. I'll give God a Sunday service. But Monday through Saturday is mine. Oh, my friend, that's a rebellious spirit. It's a resisting spirit to what the Holy Spirit desires to do in your life. Do you not understand that God wants you to experience the kingdom of God in this life and in your life? Do you not understand yet that God wants to prosper you and bless you and heal you and allow you to walk in complete wholeness in Him? Do you not realize that he wants you to be focused on righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost? 
And and my my beloved brother or sister, if you get you cannot approach your Christian journey with God with partial obedience. Uh, I'll obey God in this area, but that area, no. Hesitancy is the enemy of obedience. Hesitancy. What, what are you waiting on? I mean, life's too short to pussyfoot around. What are, you, what are you waiting on? Come on, you don't need me to name out and get a word of knowledge and tell you what God has already told you. What are you waiting on in obeying God? What are you waiting on? Maybe there's a neighbor that the Holy Spirit has just impressed upon you to speak to them, to say something to them. Maybe God, maybe God has pointed his finger on your finances and specifically said, listen, that ministry you listen to, you, you're blessed by, you're encouraged by, I want you to sow a financial seed into that ministry. What are you waiting on? Whether we realize it or not, you and I, through our hesitancy, can tie the hands of God, so to speak, so that we do not enjoy, receive, and walk in all that he has for us. We're either too busy or we're hesitant in doing the will of God. You know the only person, really, the primary person that is, is being hurt in lack of obedience is you, but also, what about other people that God would use you in obeying God Maybe God has told you to do something, to go, whatever it may be. It doesn't really matter what I grab out of the air to say to you. You know what the Holy Ghost has said to you. What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? What's holding you back? Is it the love of money? Is it fear? What is it? Because when you get to the place that you have yielded and surrendered and submitted everything. You know, we want, and I can hear some say, well, we already have victory over the devil. Well, when you look at some people's lives, they don't have victory over the devil. The devil is kicking their butt. And they're a believer. And they want to walk in freedom. They want to walk in that authority of the kingdom of God. They want to walk in that. Well, James says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Some Christians go right past that submitting to God, and they just start binding the devil in Jesus' name. But yet, they're not walking in submission to God. You can bind the devil all you want. You can throw Jesus' name at it all you want. You're not going to find victory. You're going to have to do it. God's way. Do we not understand that when we try to change the prescription laid out in the scripture, the plan, the architectural plan that God has laid out in his word for your life, when we change one thing, it changes everything. Well, I'm not going to submit to God, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to try to resist the devil. I'm going to look the other way. And I'm going to believe that the devil's going to flee from you. And you do it, and guess what? The devil says, boo. You're going to have to do it God's way. And the first thing is submitting to God. Not submitting to me. Submitting to God. Who is God? What, why, why is it that you're so fearful in submitting and surrendering to God? Could it be that your image... Your mental image of God is that he's a big, bad, terrible tyrant, that he's got a club in his hand and he's waiting any moment for you to mess up so he can clobber you? Or do you picture him as the word depicts him? Oh, yeah, I know. We can find scripture. The terror of the Lord. I, oh, I know that. You, yeah, you don't want to get on God's bad side, but thank God we are under grace. Whether, whether we like it or not, some people don't like that. We're under grace. We're not under the law anymore. 
We're under a better, a new, a living covenant with God through the blood of Jesus who has taken all of our transgressions, all of our sins, all of our iniquities and nailed them to the cross. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. You are not a better version of who you used to be. You are a brand new person. You have to change identity. You cannot identify with who you used to be. You've got to begin to identify with who you already are in Christ. I'm a child of God. I am forgiven, I am righteous, I am justified, I am sanctified, I am holy. You do know that you're not holy because of what you do. You're holy because of what he's done. Does God want you to live right, do right? Let me just nip that in the bud. Yes. But you living right and doing right is not what makes you holy, doesn't make you righteous, doesn't justify you, doesn't sanctify you. It is the, it's very simple. The moment we take away from what the blood of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus accomplished, the moment we add one little thing, one little action, one little righteous deed. I didn't cuss today. I'm holy. The moment we add one little thing, Jesus talked about the leaven of the the Pharisees and he told the disciples to beware of it. Why? Because a little bit of the leaven leavens the whole lump. And what is he talking about when he talks about leaven? He's talking about the law. The Pharisees, they were known to be (laughs) self-righteous people that love God. Don't get me wrong. They love God. Listen, Pharisees weren't full of the devil. Sadducees were not evil either. But they thought that they... Their relationship with God was based upon them maintaining that relationship through what they do or what they didn't do. And that is not the relationship that you and I now have. We now have a better living new covenant with God. It's a covenant of grace that every righteous act, every righteous requirement that a holy God demanded was laid upon Jesus and met by Jesus. I want you to think about that for just a moment because it's very easy to try to mix a little bit of the law with grace and you can't do it. It will ruin the whole lump. The moment that you and I come to a clearer understanding, and I said clearer because it is something that's progressive. We grow in it. We learn. But the moment that you realize that you are accepted by God as a person who has received Jesus, you are accepted as if you met every righteous requirement under the law. That's why... Every time I hear somebody say, we're sinners saved by grace, it's all I can do to not bite my tongue off because that is not who you are. Songs that declare, that's why when I sing Amazing Grace, I cannot sing that saved a wretch like me. Oh, I used to be a wretch, but now I'm righteous. And so are you if you've received what Christ has done. And listen, some of these things, we just accept it, apply it. But other, uh, in other set settings and other people, it's, it's a gradual understanding and growing. But you've got to begin by saying, Jesus said it is finished. What does that mean? Does that just mean, okay, he's going to go ahead and give up the ghost? Or does it mean something more? And my friend, it means much more then okay, I'm drawing my last breath. 
it is finished, meaning that, that all of the sacrifices, all of the blood sacrifices that have been made, they no longer have to be made. The priest no longer has to go into the Holy of Holies because our high priest, Jesus, died, was raised from the dead, and went in and offered up himself once and for all, for all mankind, and the whosoevers that receive him, they are the benefactors of what he did. Now, I didn't plan on getting into all that tonight, but it's important to understand that. That when we start talking about obeying God, you're not obeying God to be a better Christian. You're not obeying God to stay saved. You're obeying God because now you're a child of God. He's put a brand new, he's cleansed you, washed you, forgiven you. And now he has given you a spirit that cries out, Abba, Father. Father, I worship you, I bless you. Magnify your name. Hallelujah. He's given you a spirit that draws from him, knowing that he's El Shaddai, the all-breasted one. I draw my nourishment from him. I don't want to keep my distance from him. I want to get as close as I possibly can to him. I don't want to resist what he's telling me to do. I want to obey. And better yet, I want to grow and develop and mature to a place that I'm just walking in agreement with him. I have shared before the difference between obedience and agreement. When I was growing up in my mother and my father's home, they would tell me, when you walk out of a room, turn the light out. Didn't make sense to me. But that's my mom and my dad. I'm going to flip that light out. Now, as a grown man, I understand. I understand. I understand. There's more to it than just flipping a switch. It's good stewardship. If you're not in the room, why leave the light on? Flip the light off. Now, I know some of you, that you think that's nitpicky. But I'm going to tell you, the, more you, the longer you live for the Lord, you'll realize concerning your money that it's not just 10% that belongs to him. It's everything. He allows me to keep the 90%. But the truth be told, everything. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And that includes me. All of my life, everything that I am, Anything that's ever gotten accomplished in my life, it is always to God be the glory. What great things he has done. You know, the longer we live for Jesus in this life, the smaller we become. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean insignificant. I don't mean unimportant. But I mean that all our desire is not that men would recognize us, but that men would see Jesus in us. Oh, that I would decrease so that he would increase. Do you know that he cannot increase in your life while you are increasing in your life? And what, what, what is the simple step and the remedy to change the direction of whether we are increasing or decreasing, whether we're, 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 we're desiring people to, to be attracted to us and recognize us or recognize Jesus. There's one word, and it's humility. You know, the interesting thing is God promises in his word, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he would exalt you in due season. You see, it's not that God doesn't want you to enjoy the blessings of the Lord. It's not that God does not want you to prosper and be blessed in every aspect of your life. It's that he wants to receive the glory. And you and I are simply along for 
the ride. Obedience. Hesitancy is the enemy of obedience. Now, I knew we wouldn't get to servanthood tonight, but how important is obedience to you? How important is it for you and I to have a soft, supple soul in that the moment that the Holy Spirit speaks to us, we obey. I've shared this, and I'm going to share it in closing tonight, that in my life, over the years, I have grown and developed to quick obedience. When God tells me to do something, I don't hesitate. And there's several reasons. One of them is I don't want to give time for hesitancy to find a lodging place in my mind. When I know that I've heard from God, when I know that the Holy Spirit has spoken to me, I simply obey quickly. Now, I'm not saying that to brag on myself because it's taken years for me to get to that point. But what about you? What about your life? What areas are you willing to be open and honest and transparent to the Holy Spirit that He would be able to come into your life in such a way that you can truly say, I have an intimate relationship with God. Father, in Jesus' name, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for your faithfulness. Holy Spirit, I'm so grateful that you're here and you're present in the earth. And I pray for that one that is going to come across this program and the Holy Spirit of God is going to minister to them and touch them in such a way that he lays open their life and he asks, will you trust me by giving me that area of your life? Will you take a step toward obedience? Will you take a step toward heading in the right direction? I pray, Lord, the answer for all would be yes. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I want to pray for you if you've came across this program tonight and you don't know Jesus. You don't know the Lord. You may be religious, but you don't know Jesus. You don't live and walk in the relationship of intimacy that I've talked about tonight. I want to pray for you. And I'm going to invite you to pray with me. What you need is Jesus. You don't need more money. You don't need a better house or a faster car. What you need is a relationship with God through what Christ has done. And it's a prayer of invitation. And I want to ask you to pray along with me. Would you repeat this prayer and mean it with your heart by faith? Would you pray with me? Would you say, Heavenly Father, I come before you tonight. I thank you for what Jesus has done for me. Jesus, I receive all that you have done into my life. I receive the forgiveness of my sins. And I receive you to be the pilot, to be the one who leads and guides my life for the rest of my life. Forgive me for my sins. Wash me, cleanse me, and make me whole. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you've asked Christ to come into your life, the Bible says that all of heaven rejoices over one person making that decision and receiving what Christ has done for them. We rejoice with you. We celebrate with you this new beginning. I want to encourage you, if you have a Bible, go into the New Testament to the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's the fourth book of the Bible and begin reading. Now listen, if King James is a little bit difficult for you, get a new King James. Get a Bible and begin to read. But before you do, say a little prayer and say, Holy Spirit, I'm about to open the book of life. Would you please reveal this word to me? And he will 
answer that prayer. Hey, I want to invite you to go to our YouTube channel at Faith is a Victory Fellowship at YouTube. There you're going to find all of our programs. And while you're there, take a moment and subscribe. Last but not least, in the description section, you're going to find several safe, simple, and secure ways in which you can give with confidence a financial gift to help us continue to teach and to preach the good news of a life without fear. I want to thank you so much for taking time to be with me tonight. I pray that you'll enjoy the rest of your evening and have a blessed weekend. Until Monday, right back here at Faith is the Victory Fellowship Facebook page at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, where we'll once again begin our programs, The Good News of a Life Without Fear. But until then, I want to tell you that I love you, God loves you, and as always, my friend, never ever forget, he is faithful.